All right, we are back here on the Crash Report. Uh, you can listen to the show anywhere you get podcasts. You can go to our YouTube channel to watch uh, full interviews, highlights, clips, and more from the show. Uh, and you can follow us on all social media at Crash Report Show. And uh, right now I'm here with uh, Carla Harvey from Butcher Babies. Carla, what's happening? Hey, good morning. Uh, yeah, you're in Chicago now, right? I saw you, uh, you moved like a year ago, or right when the pandemic started or something. So I moved to L.A., gosh, like over 20 years ago, like 25 years ago, coming from Detroit, you know, coming from the Midwest. And I said, I will never, ever, ever, ever move back to the Midwest. Yet I find myself here buried in the snow. And to be honest, I really love it. Love does. Love uh, makes you do crazy things, they say. It, it really does. Um, so, my, you know, I came here to be with my boyfriend, Charlie from Anthrax. And um, he can't move to L.A. because his, his daughter is here, which is fine. And I, like I said, I actually really, really have adapted well. And I love it. I think I needed a break from L.A., especially during the beginning of the pandemic. L.A. just felt like um, like the walls were closing in because you couldn't you know, leave the house. And you know how it is in L.A. Everyone lives in tiny apartments that cost, you know, $2,500 a month. And it's just very, it's a stressful life as it is. And then with all the added weight of the pandemic, I'll tell you, it feels really nice to be out in a place where I have land and clean air for once. <laughs> How about this weather though? I'm, I'm in the middle. I'm in Ohio, okay. and, um, but I think Chicago has got it pretty rough right now. Right? You guys have like a ton of snow. We got really dumped on. Um, I was, I went to Florida for the first part of the blizzard, got a escape, and then we came back. And then the next day, of course, it dumped all over us again. But for me, um, I, I'm so self-contained. Like, I'm happy to be at home, you know, drawing, painting, uh, playing music. We have a studio here. So I'm, I'm cool with looking at it for a few days. I just uh, I get a little antsy when it's time for me to go drive around somewhere. But I'm lucky I don't have, you know, typical nine to five where I have to, you know, scrape the snow off the car in the morning and <laughs> drive to work. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's a, a horrible thing. I, I, uh, I, I kind of like Ohio, but I, when it, when it's winter time, I'm like, fuck this, I'm getting out of here. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, this, uh, you know, this pandemic is just wild. I know you guys had a, a, a live stream concert you were supposed to do in December that, that had to get postponed because a member of, of your team had, had uh, COVID, I believe. Um, are they uh, are they good to go? I haven't heard anything since, so I'm assuming everything's good to go. Everyone's great. Everyone's feeling good. Um, and yeah, it, it sucked because you know we we were so excited to get together and do something. I think that was the biggest part of all. You know, bummed that we couldn't do this thing that we had been waiting to do, but um, we're rescheduling. We'll announce that really soon, and things will go as planned this time. But yeah, we, we felt like it was the best thing to do to cancel everything to make sure that everyone um, was safe and that we didn't infect anyone outside the band and everything. And, um, you know, we were lucky. Nobody else really got it except this one, you know, person. So we were we were lucky. But like I said, safety first in these situations. Well, uh, you know, the, the pandemic really kind of fucked things up for, for a lot of people, slowed everyone down. But I mean, you guys have been uh, staying fairly active. I mean, you have you have the new single, uh, which we'll get into in a little bit. But I know you you also uh, came out with uh, with with wine, your own wine, Butcher Baby's Wine. Yeah, it's actually our second wine. So we're all, oh. um, you know, we love wine. You know, I used to only be a whiskey drinker, but Heidi loved wine. And so I started drinking wine with her and she kind of introduced me to different flavors that she thought that I would like. And then my boyfriend is also, he loves wine. Um, so they kind of educated me on the kinds that I would like. And now I'm a complete wine snob. <laughs> so, I, but it's, it's, it's it. fun. I feel like doing something different, especially in this like new landscape um, where, you know, bands are almost their own little mini merch stores all the time. Why not offer something cool that you can kind of indulge in with your fans, you know? And we would do Twitches and I'd be drinking wine and drawing on Twitch while, um, you know, the fans were drawing with me. We do a little drink and draws. They're drinking our wine at home. I'm drinking the wine at my home, but we're all hanging out together, sharing an experience. So it all it all goes together. And it's it's been, like I said, it's been neat to find new things to do during this time. Well, and it's, it's cool because, uh, you know, I see a lot of bands come out with, you know, beer, like that's the, the big thing is every band on planet earth now has their, their own beer and, you know, wine isn't, uh, you know, I haven't seen as many bands, you know, come out with their own wine. So it is, yeah. well, it is I don't drink beer at all. 
well. So I would, I know Henry and Heidi love beer. Um, I've never had a whole beer in my life. Can't stand the taste of it. So never had a whole, but not even one here and there. I just, I don't get it. I, I think beer drinkers <laughs> are crazy. I, it's just so gross to me drinking a giant thing of beer. I, I can't do it. You know, give me a glass of whiskey. I'm fine. I just can't stand the thought of drinking a whole beer. You know, I was I was reading when you, you were uh, talking about the the wine and you had said, uh, haven't we all been at the bottom of the bottle at some point? Name a better way to uh, commiserate about it than by writing an anthem that turns the heartache into a celebration. And I was curious, uh, you know, about maybe a specific time where uh, you felt that you were at the the bottom of the bottle. Oh God, I mean, so many times. <laughs> I will say one thing that I thought is funny. I, years ago, I went through a, um, a really bad breakup and me and Heidi went out and we drank all night one night. And, uh, you know, I couldn't, couldn't get out of bed the next morning. And I was like, hey, you know what? I guess I'm not really heartbroken. I'm just, I just have a hangover. <laughs> But I mean, I think that like, especially the stuff that you go through in life, it's all material. I think some of the biggest heartaches and heartbreaks and, and letdowns that you have in life, they're the best material for songs and for, you know, books. And I mean, I wrote a book that has a lot of my misery on the pages. It's just, it's the good stuff if you look at it in a way that it's cathartic and that it's um something to use in the future you know and it's something to advance you to the next level of living you know you got through that now you can master this well on i guess uh, almost on that same note you guys uh you know you left century media um i think you put out what was it your first uh like three albums out with with century media uh so, what's that we did oh. um you know, Century Media, Century Media was was great. We loved them. And they found us at a time when we were doing these Metal Mondays on the Sunset Strip with a lot of bands that are still um, around today, uh, Gemini Syndrome and uh, a bunch of bands like that. And, you know, they kind of courted us and we kind of courted them. We didn't know what to expect. It was going to be our first um, label. And, you know, we're a unique band in that we're not all, uh, you know, 18-year-old kids we all joined this band uh, later in life. We had been through bands and been disappointed. And then we found each other and started something, you know, um, some of us in our mid thirties when we started. So we had a lot to lose at the time if we signed with the wrong label, say we signed one of those crazy 360 deals that bands that are desperate to get signed, signed, and then you give away everything that you have, you know, um, and you're just, touring, touring, touring for absolutely nothing. Um, we had to be smart about it and we really had to think about what we wanted to do. And Century Media, just, they were the ones that offered us uh, something that we thought we could work with. And, you know, it was really exciting um, to finally be able to record um, a real album with a big producer. I think our first album came out in 2013, Goliath, still one of my favorite albums. And it was just an incredible time in our lives and Century Media was really um, awesome to us um, in the beginning. And I just feel like as time goes on, you, um, you know, first of all, they, they sold to Sony and uh, things were different. They weren't as personal as they were in the beginning. And so we thought we'd like to make a change and kind of try to navigate this new landscape where you don't have to have a label. It's a really interesting time to be an artist um, and to try these kind of new things and see where they go. And hey, if it doesn't work, we can always change it again. But right now we're kind of enjoying just uh, being free agents, calling the shots and um, doing what we feel is right for our career in the moment. Well, and it's got to be a very, uh, you know, just freeing feeling in, in terms of even just the writing the songs. I mean, you don't have to answer to anyone and nobody can be like, ah, I, I, you got to change this. We don't want to put this out. You know, you got to do this and do that. And, you know, I know a lot of bands that uh, they, they are, you know, they're they're independent. They're, they set up their own like dummy labels and, and it works. It works great for them. Uh, you know, I will say that Century Media did give us the freedom uh, creatively to do whatever we wanted. I think that we were one of those bands that they were like, we want this band, but we don't really know exactly what it is. I think that's the problem that everybody has with us. They're like, what the hell is this? You know, two female singers, uh, this metal band, they don't really know 
what they want from us. So they let us be creative. They let us explore. They let us try anything that we want to try. So that was a huge gift. And now we're just taking that a step further by doing it completely um, on our own. You know, I was, uh, when I was setting this up uh, with your publicist and she, she had mentioned to me that you are a, uh, a death doula. And uh, I, I've never even heard of that in my entire life. That's how like uncultured I guess I am, but you're not. A lot of people haven't heard about it. Well, she she sends me this this uh, you know an article about it. And I was I was reading about it, and uh, my God, it's so interesting. And then when when we got to set up, I was watching uh, some other interviews with you and, and you talking about it. And it, it's such a uh, such a crazy thing. I mean, what made you want to get into uh, I guess the the death industry? I mean, that's a very dark and gloomy thing to be a part of. I would think. Um. I. I see it a little bit differently. I see it as a positive thing. I see it as, you know, um, something that is, can be healing for people and helpful. I was always interested in the death industry since I was a, a young kid. Um, I wanted to be an embalmer and I was just fascinated by death and all of its aspects and like why we had to die um, and just, you know, what happens after we die. I, I've been an atheist since I was a very small child. so. I didn't believe in, you know, going to a better place. So I was constantly in my mind trying to understand what really happens to us. Is there an energy exchange? What goes on? So that fascination, again, turned to me going to school to be an embalmer and be a funeral director, um, which I loved. Um, but when the band started up, I had no time because, you know, being in the embalming industry, funeral service, that it's, it's more than a nine to five job, even it's, you're on call all the time. You don't have holidays, you don't have weekends, and you definitely don't have three months off to go tour the world whenever you want yeah, sure. so I had to make the decision to give that up. So um, while we were touring, I got multiple certifications in, uh, in grief co coaching, counseling, being a death doula, so that I could continue on my own time to still participate in the industry, which I'm, I've really, really um, loved doing the last couple of years. I've been doing Skype sessions with people all around the world. And it's like, there's just a certain thing that you get from death care and helping people that is like nothing else. It's just really fulfilling to me. I do believe it's my life's calling, my life's work to be able to help people in that time. And death doula work is really special because it really caters to um, the person who is who is dying um, rather than just the family. I mean, you help the family as well, but death doula work, um, just it's like, think about dying alone or dying in a situation that you don't want to be in. For instance, people don't even realize that it's perfectly fine to say during the, if you're terminally ill and you know that you're going to go, you can dictate what you would like, you know, during that time so that you feel peaceful as you're passing, what smells that you want, what, um, what music you want playing, who you want around you, what, how you want the touch to be. Do you want to be touched? Do you want to be massaged? Do you want your hand held or do you want to be alone? There's so many things that people think about. Maybe people don't think about that, but I think about stuff like that. And people who are terminally ill think about stuff like that. And um, I think it's just really important to know that you have choices in every aspect of your life, um, especially when it comes to to death and how you want those moments to be. I'm really into planning your own funerals. I'm into creating legacy projects with people. You know, if you're given a, a six months to live and you're like, wait a second, I need more time. I want to do this, this, this. A death doula can come in and help you finish those things, you know, do your legacy projects and, and uh, just help you tie up loose ends that maybe you don't feel comfortable having your family help you with or, you know, facilitating those hard conversations that you have to have with your family when you know you're not going to be around um, physically for them anymore. There's a lot that goes into it. And um, it's something that, like, again, I'm super passionate about. And I hope to raise more awareness about that this, this actually exists and you don't have to feel alone in, in this part of your life. Well, and, and just, just to clarify, you know, people uh, watching or listening don't quite understand what it, this, it's not like hospice. You're, you're more, you're not taking care of them. You're more just kind of comforting them and, 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 and helping them with the process of, you know, you are going to die soon. Yeah, it's, it's a whole different thing. I did work in hospice for a couple of years and um, that was kind of where 
my love for the kind of death doula industry started because I noticed that in hospice care, um, I'm, hospice is an amazing thing, especially if you have the right nurses, but um, sometimes it's, it's a little bit cold and clinical and um, death doulas offer a bit of a warmer approach, a more personal approach, um, rather than just keeping you comfortable physically, we're comforting you uh, mentally and making sure that you're prepared for this next stage in your life. And I was, I think uh, you had said at, at one point that a lot of your clientele are like, like metalheads, like fans yeah. of maybe, you know, your band or, or just metal in general. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a natural thing. You know, they know I'm in a band and, but I, the cool thing is, is that I think that most of my clients say that they didn't feel comfortable opening up. They didn't feel comfortable talking about what we talk about um, to anyone else. And they've realized that it's okay to feel the feelings that they feel. And um, so I, I, I love that, you know, I think metalheads in general, you know, a lot of us are kind of disenfranchised and we don't know how to process certain feelings. Um, and to be able to give back to the community that's given me so much, you know, with my career is an awesome feeling for me. Well, and it, it's cool that, that you're, you know, able to, to work, especially, you know, with touring, coming to a screeching hall, you know, you still have things to do. And, and a lot of, especially in music, I mean, most, most people kind of didn't get into this with like a, a backup plan or a plan B of sorts. It was like, if I don't succeed, I, I guess I'm fucked, you know? And you know, I, I am the kind of person that I do not believe in not having a plan B for a number of reasons. I think it's, it's always important to have an education. Um, I think it's important to have at least a trade, something that you can do if shit hits the fan, because especially nowadays, you know, it's different. The entertainment world is different. You know, back in the day, people had a huge advances and, you know, there was a lot of money coming in and record sales were different. Nowadays, it's more of a struggle. And um, I don't think there's anything cool about, you know, coming home from a tour and sleeping on someone's couch and mooching off people. Like, that's not cool. It's, <laughs> I feel like it's, it, you, you have to have something that you do when you need to work. Now, if you can make all your money um, doing music and that's fucking awesome. But the majority of people who decide right now they're gonna be in a band are not gonna be able to um, spend their whole lives making money doing that. So, you know, be passionate about something. And the other thing is about having a plan B. Sometimes that plan B kind of, um, you know, makes itself into your, your plan A of being a rock star. I've written a bunch of songs with my band about my experiences um, with, you know, death work. Um, all the, the whole band, we write about what we know, whether it's, you know, um, you know, working in the death industry or stuff that's very personal to us. So all of those plan B things that you think were not going to be relevant in your, your, uh, your grand scheme of what you think you want to do uh, musically or art artist wise, they do factor in. And it's just another cool fucking level of you to, um, to put out to the world. No, I, I agree. And you know, it, it is, uh, especially now I, I kind of feel like, um, not that there's not new bands that, that can't, uh, you know, make a living off their music because there are plenty to do, but there's 30 times as many that don't. And I, I kind of feel like the age of the rock star is, is kind of dead, so to speak. I mean, there's, there's really no more like, uh, you know, I don't know, like Axl Rose or something where they're like, yeah. holy shit, like, look at that guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, speaking of Axl Rose, we were playing, uh, I think it was, um, Gosh, the, the big rock festival that's in Ohio. What's it oh, called? Uh, rock on the Range. I, I saw you there, I believe. It slipped my mind. And Axl Rose walked through catering. And Axl Rose is my favorite of all time. Like that, uh, Guns N' Roses was what sparked my interest in, in rock and roll, you know, when I was just a kid. But he walked through and the whole room was silent. Like that's a rock star's rock star, <laughs> you know? And it was Absolutely. Like, and, and the, it was like I, watching a unicorn walk through the room. And that you're right. Like that just... It doesn't exist anymore. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a weird thing. And I, I wish it would come back. You know what I mean? But I don't like, I don't know who that person is to the new generation. I, I just don't know. To me, the, the only one, and I'm, I'm sure people are going to give me shit for this, but I, I feel like, uh, uh, you know, Tobias Forge from ghost, I, I feel like he's kind of got that persona to him. Yeah. But, you know, I've uh, other people have been on this show and, and, uh, that, you know, we've, we've had a conversation about, 
you look at uh, a lot of these newer bands and uh, I mean, you can't pick a single one out of the lineup, you know, it's like, oh, okay, tell me who so-and-so is. You're like, uh, I, I don't know, you know? Yeah. And it seems like when I was a kid, you know, I knew every single person in a band and they all had their own personalities and they were all special, you know, for some reason. And I think my band is like that. I don't think I'm biased. I really do think that my band, you look at us and we're all little caricatures, which I think is if, if your band can become a caricature of themselves, like every person, that's something special. All of us have a very distinct personality and a distinct look. And I don't know, I think that's, that's missing in a lot of bands. I, I do agree. Um, so, uh, you know, before we, we move on with going back to the death doula thing, uh, you know, you were mentioned helping like people out with like legacy projects and, and things like that. Is there, you know, any, uh, anything in particular that, that was really kind of stuck with you? And I don't know what, what you can say, what you can't say, but is there anything that, that has really just kind of never left you and, and had like a long lasting effect on you? Well, I will say that, um, I think that what sparked my interest in grief work actually was something that happened to me when I was uh, like 16 working at a gas station. And it was something that was so simple, but it changed my perspective on um, human beings and loss. And this woman came um, to the gas station. I could see her, I was working the counter. I could see her outside and um, she was like kicking stuff around being like really erratic and uh, she couldn't get the gas pump to work. And, you know, in my head, 16 year old, I'm thinking, God, this crazy bitch is going to come in here and start yelling at me any second. And she did. She walks in and she says, I can't get this gas pump to work. And she's screaming in the store. And, uh, you know, I remained calm and I said, I'll come out and help you. And um, I was a hothead in high school. So I don't even know why I retained <laughs> my head at that moment. But I went out and I helped her. And um, she said to me, afterwards uh she said thank you my husband just died he always pumped the gas i don't know how <laughs> sorry i always get emotional when i talk about it because it was such a strong moment to me and such a sad thing like there's so, so many people and they don't know what to do when someone dies that you know paid the bills wrote the checks pumped the gas something so simple but she didn't know how to do it because she never did it before and just I I'm just a very sensitive person it bothered me so much and uh I always said I wanted to help people that um that had to go through that and so um I love working with families so it's not just the people who are you know who are terminally ill or dying but it's working with people who are um dealing with extreme loss so uh between the legacy projects for terminally ill but also just helping people out in the new normal that's their life after they've suffered a great loss and they don't know where to start sometimes starting is just pumping your gas sorry <laughs> no no you're, you're fine you're fine i um it just i guess i'm still till this day i think about it and i think about her and uh you know that's why i want to help people because a lot of people would you know go back and say what a fucking weirdo she doesn't know how to pump her gas what's wrong with her and laugh at her but um i could have been a catalyst for her to you know start her new normal and that's an important thing you know helping someone facilitate their new life after loss so do you do you stay in touch uh like with with like the families of of the the like of your clients or I do. I do. I even stay in touch with people that I worked with in hospice years ago. Um, I don't think you even realize how important hospice people are to um, people who are going through a loss. Just even something as simple as having a hospice volunteer come and um, sit and read to the person that is terminally ill for a little while so that the family can go out and do shopping or just breathe for a minute is such a huge thing. So um, it's a, you do form like lifelong connections with people and um, it's just such a fulfilling thing. And I really do encourage anyone who feels that they are drawn to the death care industry to go do it because it's, it's definitely life-changing. How do you get involved in, in something like that? I mean, you gotta, I know you, you gotta go to school and, and have yeah. a degree or. 
Well, I have a degree in mortuary science and I also have multiple certifications in um, different um, areas of death care. But something simple that you can do, and obviously it's kind of hard right now because we're in a pandemic and it's the access to um, being a volunteer is a little bit different. But you, after all this is over, I would highly suggest um, going and volunteering at your local hospice. If you just Google um, local hospice and ask what they need, it is, it's just such a, a beautiful thing to do for people. Uh, you know, I guess uh, we could probably move on to something a little, <laughs> a little more. Happy. Yeah. Cry. <laughs> you have, uh, you know, a ton of, of uh, art that you do. And I, you mentioned you had a book. Uh, and, and I think the, the Butcher Babies had like a, a comic book at one point. Um, you know, but I, I uh, want to talk about your art specifically for a moment. You know, it's, it's uh, very uh, graphic art, uh, quite uh, erotic art. I saw the, the, I think it was a painting of a, a woman with a, a gun in her vagina. Um, that was me, yeah. Not yeah. drawing of me, it was just, yes, my art. No, yeah, not you. Yeah, no, no, not you. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I, I was watching you have a discussion with somebody about it. And, uh, you know, you had said that a lot of people have, have uh, you know, kind of accused you of being derogatory and you're just trying to uh, empower women with, with artwork like that. And I think uh, women are the most beautiful thing. And just, I, I love drawing women. I mean, What's not to love, right? <laughs> women. We I just, do agree. It's just the way that, that women move, the way that they look, it just the angles of their body. It's just such a beautiful thing to draw. And women have so much power. And I just don't think uh, women always use all the power that they have. Um, it just, you know, I, 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 I love, I've always loved erotic art. I don't know why. I grew up, you know, loving Robert Williams, Robert Crumb. And, you know, I'm, I am a product of that kind of glam rock era where women were like, you know, dancing in music videos and blah, blah, blah. So I guess that's all part of my aesthetic. <laughs> do you feel like, you know, when every, and when somebody would ever give you like a hard time about it, I mean, do you ever feel like people are just, uh, they, there's always a, uh, we got to look for a reason to, to, uh, you know, accuse somebody of this or that, or, you know, oh, they're doing the fuck that, you know what I mean? Like, it, it's, it always seems like somebody has, uh, it's always somebody out there that's got to tear someone else down. Well, yeah, I mean, everyone, you know, people ask, why do you always draw that? Well, it's it's because it's my art, it's my thing. I want to do this, um, you know, but I do think that any time that you are a musician, an artist or anything, you just have to be kind of um, honest in your convictions and say, this is what I like to do. This is what I want to do. I think this is fucking cool. So this is what I'm going to do. And kind of like, just kind of make the rest of the stuff, white noise, all the naysayers, white noise. It's a, it's a hard skill to learn. Um, but at the same time, it's one of the most important things that you'll ever have to do if you uh, choose a career of entertainment. Well, and it's, I mean, entertainers to, to me, they always seem like they're uh, always very misunderstood. Uh, always. I think so. I think that we all, I think that people who are musicians and artists, we all have are kind of like flawed creatures <laughs> that might, you know, sound a little cliched, but I do think that the the best artists and musicians are have a little something, you know, that's uh, not normal or not, you know, we're not the people that were out, um, you know, uh, that were, well, I shouldn't say this because Heidi was a cheerleader, but we're typically not the kind of people that were, you know, out there, the popular kids, the jocks, the cheerleaders that were, um, you know, um, getting all the praise in school. We were kind of the loners and um, kind of tortured souls for the most part. But um, yeah, you know. Well, you know, and I, 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 uh, I feel like even, you know, back in the day when the band first started with, with the nipple tape and all that, I, I feel like, that was even, uh, you know, people would just be like, oh, my God, what a fucking, you know, gimmick or whatever. But uh, was that, you know, similar to your art in the sense that you were trying to, you know, it's 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 an empowerment thing and and, and like, you know, not not showing off, but, you know, just showing off women as, as in general. You know, people always think that we were out there parading around like, you know, models and that's not the case at all. And that was never the case. It wasn't the intention. I, we were both fans of, of plasmatics, Wendy Williams. And there was a quote that I read once years and years ago about Wendy. Um, that was something to the effect of she's not 
feminist, she transcends feminism, she's art. And I think that in my life, that's something that I always wanted to be. And whatever I did, I wanted to be art. And if, you know, and that's, that's important to me. And that back then we were just, you know, kids making a statement. We wanted to do what we wanted to do. We, we would go up there punk rock as fuck and with the nipple tape on spitting whiskey in people's faces. I mean, <laughs> our crowds were insane. I've got a picture of a guy on stage uh, with us, me and Heidi are behind him and uh, he's got a blood running down his face. I mean, our, sh our first shows were like really legit old school punk rock, just continuous crowd surfing, people's faces <laughs> punched in kind of displays of anarchy and they were fucking awesome. And when we went kind of mainstream and people started to hear about us, they didn't understand what we were doing. They didn't get it. And it's really funny to me now that um, I just saw Miley Cyrus, um, you know, on the cover of Rolling Stone with her boobs out like this. And she had been wearing a plasmatic shirt recently on a, on a, I think it was a Howard Stern show. And I was like, well, well, well. <laughs> well mean, your, your name, the, the band name came from, from yeah. Wendy Williams too, right? The, she had a song called Butcher Baby. Yeah. And we thought that everyone would get it, you know, like, of course, you know, people are going to know, but the funny thing was most people didn't know who the plasmatics were. Um, so, you know, that we set out on a path of education for these young metalheads. They would, uh, learn Wendy Williams name. You know, she really paved the way to, um, kind of do what we what we do today and uh but i think that's a you know a big misconception that we were trying to show off or trying to be um you know sexy if that wasn't the case at all we really just wanted to go up there and throw down and you know to be honest we didn't know where we were gonna be headed we didn't think that we were gonna we dreamed about it but we didn't think that we were going to be where we are today you know this internationally touring act that has done all these awesome things together we were just people just kids just best friends who wanted to um play some shows together and, and see if we could have one last chance at at music well i mean the band has has come uh, quite a long way i mean i i remember i, I think it was so maybe the first, I, it was the first time I'd ever heard of you guys and i i think it was uh, was it like mayhem did you guys do mayhem fest like I don't know, eight years, nine years ago or something. 2013. I just okay. a picture from it this morning. So yeah, 2013. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's been a, a long ride, uh, you know, since then, but uh, real quick, circling back to Miley Cyrus, I am curious because I talk about this on the show all the time, but I am, uh, I, I am so like uh, addicted to her new album. I cannot, so I, and I'm not even a pop guy. I, I don't really care for pop. And uh, have you heard her, her new album? Um, I haven't, I've heard a little bit. I'll have to listen to more and uh, check it out. It just uh, blows my mind because I, I listened to it to like make fun of it. I was like, oh, this is going to suck. And I was like, God, this is like one of the best albums I've ever heard. Uh, but as far as your art, uh, what what are you working on right now art wise? Um, so I have a big show coming up. The date keeps changing a little bit because of the pandemic. But so I'm just kind of working on more stuff for that. And uh it's, it's exhausting getting ready for an art show. You know, it's, it's my pieces for art shows are really uh, large. So right now I'm working on this, this awesome um, black Medusa with a snake Afro with a seventies, like psychedelic um, background. So it's been taking me forever. It's like 18 by 24 inches, but um, that's my next piece that I'm doing. I love bright colors. I love women, bright colors and snakes and all that kind of stuff. So I'm but I'm excited to uh, put on this, this show. I follow uh, slash on Instagram and he always uh, posts things that, uh, you know, the, the description you just gave, he's always seeming to post art kind of yeah. like on his Instagram. <laughs> I like the same stuff, <laughs> judging by his, by his taste in art. How long does it take to, to do, uh, you know, a big piece like that normally? You know, this one that I'm working on, um, it's been like a month that I've been working on it. I probably work on it, you know, four hours a day. It's, it's, the snakes are so detailed that it, it's, it's insanely, sometimes something just pops out and, you know, a few hours and then something takes, sometimes things take months. So just depends. I know like nothing about art, but you know, when you, when you decide, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. Do you kind of stick with the same thing the whole way through or, or, you know, when you're working on something, you're like, you know what, I could, I could change this and this might actually look better than what I was thinking. 
Yeah, so what I do is a mock-up first, uh, just a pencil sketch mock-up and to make sure that it's exactly how I want it. And uh, then I make another version. So you're basically doing like three to get the one that you want, but then I do, you know, an ink version and then I'll do full color. So, um, and things change from the time it's pencil to, you know, if something's not right aesthetically or something's not, if something's off, but, um, or the hands not right. Hands are so hard, hands and feet so hard. <laughs> I, when I was a kid in, in school and we had to do stuff in art class, it was, yeah, always drawing uh, body parts in general just seemed very difficult. Yeah, it is. And I draw, I also draw a lot of um, anatomical hearts and skulls. You know, it, a big part of mortuary school was restorative art. And um, so we had to do a lot of rebuilding of faces and stuff like that. So I was always really fascinated by, um, you know, the human body and art in that way. And you have a you have a like website where where people can buy uh, like your artwork. I do. It's carlaharvey.com. dot com. Um, and what uh, what is coming next for the butcher babies? When uh, you know, it, it kind of feels like we're on the home stretch of this pandemic. But I mean, who knows? I also didn't think it was going to yeah. go on this long. You don't want to jinx anything, right? Yeah. So yeah. we have uh, we're going to reschedule that live stream very soon. We'll announce that. We're really excited about that. We've got another probably my personal favorite song um that we've done as of late coming out uh i think the video comes out in a week um it's just a fun kitschy little video i can't wait for everyone to see it so that's something to look forward to in, in butcher baby's land and we've got just a couple more new songs coming out and then we'll probably go record more songs and um it's it's exciting to finally be getting stuff out there you know we really had to learn what to do in this new you know, this pandemic at the beginning of it, we were supposed to go on a tour with Hell Yeah. And we had a timeline of releasing things, you know, knowing that we'd be on tour, but everything had to change. So some of the stuff that we're releasing um, in the coming weeks, we've been sitting on for so long. And it's just, you know, it, you know how hard it is to keep a secret or to keep something in your back pocket that you really oh, want yeah. to pull off. So um, we're pretty excited to get it out there. And uh, where can uh, people find you uh, online? Um, you can find just Google Butcher Babies it's everywhere. Butcher Babies official. Um, and uh, we, we're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you know, at Butcher Babies. I'm at Carla Harvey all over across all social media stuff. And yeah, come, come chat with us. We love talking to people online. We are really active on our social media. And so um, come say hello. All right. Uh, well, Carla, uh, thank you. I, I do appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And we will be right back on the Crash Report. Hang on. We'll see you next time on the Crash Report. While you wait, make sure to like and subscribe to the show, damn it. Thanks for listening.